now I'll be walking you through the advanced baseline and uh, one very important thing to note is that uh, most of the notebook is pretty similar to the simple baseline that is we'll be setting up the uh, data sets downloading them and uh, ex looking at them and exploring them pretty similarly so I will not be covering the parts that are similar instead I will be going over the differences and what we want to take away from this notebook specifically we want to introduce um, uh, the use of the segmentation models library which contains uh, quite a lot of network architectures and including their pre-trained ways for example ResNet, DenseNet and so on and also the ability to easily create a unit using any one of these existing architectures with their pre-trained weights which we will be making use of in this case to get a very uh, uh, get better performance compared to the previous notebook and i will be skipping over till we start to see the first uh, changes that are different in this notebook so the first place we see those changes are in the data generator itself um, you will notice that even though we're using segmentation models library we will be still using the Keras sequence generator because uh, in the segmentation models library you can you will see that you can set the backend to be anything specific uh, PyTorch or Keras in this case and you can write a data, data loader in PyTorch or sequence generator in Keras and it will still accept it if the backend is set correctly the places where we'll start to see some differences are one we will be making use of a library called Albumentations for uh, doing simple augmentations augmentations allow us to increase the variety of the data set and increase uh, have a few limited samples but increase the kind of um, diversity we see among these samples by taking random crops or flipping them and changing the color, uh, increasing the contrast randomly, and so on, adding noise as well. So we will be making use of those three specific augmentations that I mentioned earlier that should really have no negative impact on uh, the quality of the training data. And additionally, the other thing that we will specify here is a callable that will be called if this flag is set to true. Now, what this callable is, is uh, for example, if you take pre-trained weights uh, trained on a particular data set, they are going to have some um, uh, uh, methods that they were pre-trained on. So, uh, and specifically, they could be normalized using certain uh, mean and standard deviations. So, we will need to pre-process them uh, to make sure that they are in the same range as uh, uh, to make sure that our data is in the same range and has the same mean and standard deviation as the data that was provided to the model during training so this data can be fetched from these libraries on the models themselves and they are fed to the data loader that we have written and uh, they can be called if additionally on the data the rest of the methods you see will be very similar to what we have already written so we load in images batch by batch and we return them using the get item method the next place you'll start to notice difference is obviously the creation of the model itself like i mentioned earlier we'll be making use of the keras backend and that's because we can then uh, plug in a sequence generator written using the keras sequence api and that should directly work with this model that's been um, that's that we're just making use of directly after downloading it so the backbone corresponds to the actual architecture that we want to use in creation of our unit so the, what we'll be making use of is dense net 121 there are other options as well which you can look through in the documentation for the segmentation models and there's ResNet 50 for example and dense net 101 and we're just going to go with the largest one just to see how far we can push it uh, the freeze encoder parameter is set to true will ensure that the pre-trained weights are not updated and only the prediction layers weights are updated in that case you're essentially fine-tuning the model if you set this to false you'll be training all the layers so uh, it will take a little longer to train but if your data set is slightly specific this might be the better option to go with 
Finally, we'll, the other flag specifies if you want to use augmentations or not. And since we are just making use of augmentations in using the augmentations library, we'll just set that to true. So that for the training and validation data for the augmentations are applied. And using the segmentation models get pre-processing method for a particular backbone, we can get the kind of pre-processing of uh, method, uh, functions that were used for that particular architecture and passing it to that passing it to our data loader, the data loader should take care of calling this function on our input so that every time uh, the same pre-processing methods are applied to our data as well. Finally, we create the model using the segmentation model.unet, which takes in a backbone, which is just a string corresponding to the name. Uh, whether the, you want to use weights, if set to none, it'll just initialize it randomly and you can set it to image net if you want to use the image net pre-trained weights and code free you can freeze the layers like i mentioned passing in this flag to encode or freeze and then the activation function which we'll be using sigmoid for so everything scaled in the range zero to one the optimizer then we will be making use of the atom optimizer with a learning rate of one e power minus four and this is very simple similar to what you would do with the standard tensorflow model that you defined using the sequence API or a functional API for that matter. You'll call the model.compile uh, with the optimizer and the loss function. And the loss function has been similarly defined above with the three losses that we discussed earlier, which is structural similarity index and the L1 loss for a pixel by pixel, and then the edge source to preserve more features across the edges and sharper edges. Each of these losses have been assigned weights, which you can tinker with if you feel like performance in one aspect is not that great and you feel like more importance should be placed to that. Then we create the data loaders for the training and the test data set, which is pretty similar to what we did earlier, except the difference would be pre-processing and the augmentations. Training it is very similar to how we trained the previous model. And you just call dot fit with the train loader, specify the validation data set, in this case, the validation loader, and the number of epochs you want to train it for. After training it for a while, you can take a look at its metrics at the loss curve, and you'll notice that the performance of this, at least on paper, on, on judging from this curve, is much better than the one we saw earlier, especially because we're making use of a, a network architecture that's proven to be pretty useful in computer vision applications. Taking analyzing what the output looks like for a few samples from the validation data set, we started to notice that it's definitely blurry, and but you'll notice that quite a lot of these depths are accurately predicted, and you'll notice that they are in the ballpark of what we expect them to be like. Although it's not perfect and the edges are not accurate, you'll notice that it's much better than the method we saw previously. But like I mentioned earlier, playing around with the hyperparameters and model architectures and Playing around with the different flags that we've exposed to, you should be able to boost scores and get better performance out of the model. Finally, we will need to make predictions on uh, the data set. And obviously, we want to create a data loader or the test data set. However, we will not be using any pre processing methods and we will also not be. Uh, specifying any uh, augmentations to be used. Uh, sorry, we will be using pre-processing methods, although we will not be using any augmentations because we don't want to augment the, uh, this data set. Finally, the only thing that's left to do is to make the predictions on the test set so that we can submit the predictions to the evaluation server so we can find out what the scores look like on the hidden test set. Uh, the little difference that we'll notice here compared to the previous approach is that uh, here, in order to pre preserve the best performance and the best accuracy, what we will be doing is splitting one image into three chunks, so three squares, and feed each one of these images uh, It's the standard pre-processing techniques that we used without the augmentations, though, because we don't want to augment the data. But with those pre-processing techniques, like I mentioned earlier, and resize it to the standard size, get the predictions from the model, and then resize them back to what they were and stitch them all to create one long image. So what the flow would look like is we have these uh, three 
300 by 300 chunks which totally add up to 900 by 300 900 being the width and 300 being the height so we split them into three of three such chunks and we resize them down to 256 by 256 which is what the model is trained on we get the predictions which are also in the range of two uh, with with the dimensions uh, 256 and 256 which we resize to 300 and 300 by 300 then we stitch these three predictions together to form a single large prediction which is uh, in 900 in pixels in width and 300 pixels in height performing that for one sample in the validation set looks something like below where we can di distinctly see the lines of separation but that really should not affect the score way too much now we will just essentially need to do that for the test data frame and uh, performing the same steps that i mentioned earlier we have the predictions in the range of 0 to 1 which we'll need to multiply by 255 because the more because the evaluation of expects the values to be in the range of 0 to 255 then we can take these predictions and then save them into the compressed numpy arrays known as npz arrays and under the same file names as the image file that they were taken from uh, suffix with their dot npz of course and we can zip it and we can submit it back to aircrowd using the notebook submit uh, arguments of the aircrowd cli and with the assets directory that they are present in that should result in a score that's on the server and you might notice that the score is much higher than the one earlier